following preview was begrudgingly approved for all audiences. You're listening to Elevator Music. Welcome back to Forward Thinking, presented by the Professional Collegiate League. I'm Ricky Vellante, and I'll be joined by my co-host, David West. As usual, we'll be welcoming guests to discuss challenging the status quo, doing social good, and bringing about positive change to the world, while also talking a little bit of sports. In this episode, we're joined by a very special guest, actor and activist, Wendell Pierce. You may better know him as Bunk Moreland from HBO's The Wire, James Greer from Amazon's Jack Ryan, or in the recent West End production of Death of a Salesman, where he performed as the lead, Willie Loman. We have what I can only describe as a raw and unfiltered conversation about New Orleans, Drew Brees, police reform, changing college sports, how NBA players should use their platform for social good in their upcoming return, the approach and psyche of an actor, and much more. If you haven't already, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe Forward Thinking on your favorite podcast platform and our YouTube channel. You can also get more information at thepcleague.com slash forwardthinking. And welcome back to Forward Thinking. I'm Ricky Vellante, joined by my co-host, David West. We have yet another special guest today, one that I'm very excited about. We have actor Wendell Pierce. Wendell, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, uh, David, Ricky. Thank you. So you're a man that needs a little introduction, but just for, for the purposes of our audience, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll jump into it from there. My name is Wendell Pierce, born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. I uh, went to school here at a college prep high school, very um, uh, very on par with Stuyvesant in New York or um, Crossroads in Los Angeles. But at the same time, I went to the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts half the day, which was a performing arts high school. So I had the best of both worlds. Uh, there, studied with the likes of Winter Marcellus and Harry Connick Jr. Anthony Mackey went there after me, our new Captain America. So it has a prestigious uh, roster of alumni. Then I went and I studied uh, at Juilliard in New York, classically trained actor. I was a presidential scholar in the arts and uh, started my career around the time you gentlemen were born, about 35 years ago. I uh, am most popular for, most famous for, Bunk Moreland, the character I played on The Wire on HBO for five seasons. I am on a show now on Amazon, Jack Ryan. Um, in film, I've been in Selma. I've been in uh, Malcolm X. I've been in uh, Waiting to Exhale is a popular one. So uh, on stage, I just completed what is the highlight of my career. I played Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman on the West End. It is uh, the American Hamlet. And it was, uh, one of the, it was a historic production because this was uh, the first time on this level, a commercial level, African-American played the role in London. It had been done here. In America, Charles Dutton did it at Yale at one time, and then the recently departed Mel Winkler, rest in peace, did it at the Guthrie Theater of Minnesota. Those are the other two commercial productions. But different from theirs, only the Lohman family was black, and so it, it heightened um, the desperation that he was in, and uh, hence the title of the play, Death of a Salesman, the thing that ultimately brings him to his, his demise. But that's who I am. Um, Post Katrina, being from New Orleans, I want to be able to answer the question 20 years from now, what did you do in New Orleans' darkest hour? And I came home and reconstituted my neighborhood association meeting, uh, neighborhood association itself, put together a community development corp, and then uh, we negotiated with the city to get properties back in our area. And in an attempt to do hundreds of homes, we did 40. We rebuilt 40 and um, geothermal and solar, some of them, so with uh, some new energy efficiencies uh, that takes into account climate change. So uh, people have considered me an actor and an activist, but ultimately as an actor, you are an activist. It's the place where you reflect on society as a whole, where we come together and uh, we declare what our values are and then act on them. That's the role of being an artist. What thoughts are to the individual where you consider your personal journey. The forum of art is where you the society think on your collective journey. And hopefully uh, I'm achieving that as an actor and an activist. So that's mm -hmm. me. When 
Wendell Pierce. Now I, I'll uh, I'll just jump in real quick because you know I I uh, played with the Hornets in New Orleans for eight years. We had I think we we crossed paths maybe once or twice, and then after Katrina uh, is really really when I realized sort of who you were, I and mean, it was your voice after Katrina that I think for me personally drew me sort of to more into your work, you know, looking for the things that you would be in. So my first question would just be about what Katrina did for you because I know what it did to me. I'm not from New Orleans, but I lived in New Orleans pre-Katrina. And yeah. what happened during Katrina and then ultimately, you know, the response and just sort of what the city went through, it changed me as a as a human being, being up close and personal to it and knowing families that experienced you know, some of the some of the worst parts of us. So I just want to know from 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 your perspective as someone who's in New Orleans who was affected by it. Post Katrina, you talked about your father, and yeah. that story came alive for me. And so, I just want to get your perspective on what Katrina did to you. What did that do to you? Uh, well, Katrina was uh, uh, one of the worst catastrophes uh, in American life, as we know it. It exposed so many disparities between the rich and poor, disparities in race, and the fragility of our communities. You know. And when I say communities, I'm including the, the, the entire American aesthetic. Uh, uh, the, there's a fragility there because we go against the very thing we claim to be, a, 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 a nation of laws and equality, and every man uh, is, and woman is supposed to be treated equal. It exposed in New Orleans how there's an underclass here that a lot of people make money off of keeping that underclass. So you saw how, how easily we all can go into a situation of chaos when it comes to the disparity in, 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 in wealth, the wealth disparity, you know, all the people you saw left were the poor who didn't have means to leave, who didn't have, you know, we're going to, we've gone through a hurricane already this season. It starts June 1st and this is just 23 right. <laughs> three days into it. And uh, we've already experienced one. And, so you cannot jump up and in the course of the season leave town three, four, five times. That's going right. to cost you about five, six, seven hundred bucks. You look at that for a poor person, you know, to drop three thousand dollars in the course of a season when the median uh, average median income in New Orleans is you know twenty seven thousand dollars. You know, it, 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 it's a hit for the poor at median and average income. So it had all of that on it on the, the large level on the personal level, you saw just the evilness. You see the best in people and the worst in people. People crossing the bridge to get out of the Superdome and the convention center, met by Gretna police with shotguns shooting over their head. The people who were told by police, listen, you are in a desperate situation, go in and get provisions wherever you can in a grocery store, then saw it on the media and then it made them look bad and then all of a sudden people are shooting looters who were encouraged to go and get what you need as we get through this crisis. So the manipulation of media and to see all those poor black folks huddled together, separated as families, huddled under the I, on the I-10 waiting to be transported. And the, uh, it just reminded me of a slave trade, you know? Right. Personally, my father paid all state 40, no, 50 years. And they gave them, my mother was still alive at the time, $40 a day. And consider Katrina a 10 day event, $400. Mm. That was it. After 50 years of premiums, and they never got anything to rebuild their home, you know? And that was the real crime. No policies were honored in Louisiana, in mm. New Orleans. And to this day, they pulled out all of the majors, State Farm, all states, nationwide, all of them, Liberty Mutual. No one writes policies in Louisiana. There's, and it's a crime. And they got away with not honoring any of those policies that people paid billions of dollars into. So it was one of the great crimes in history. So that's at the 50,000 foot level. On the ground, personally, I had neighbors who died. I remember the Bynums. I always bring them up. We saw them in church that Sunday. And uh, they grew up with my father, who's 95 years old now. So are you leaving Bynum? No, we're going to stay. 
and they were two of the nine people in my neighborhood, Punch Train Park, who died. The hurricane did not flood New Orleans. It was a man-made disaster because the levees, the inner canal levees broke, poorly designed, and there's complicity with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And so that complicity of uh, negligence was also one of the great crimes because the flooding of New Orleans and the 3,000 people that died really were on a levee system that was poorly designed. We actually thought the wall that we saw bisected the earth a little further down, but really it was just sitting on top, you know, mm-hmm. a mound of dirt. But the water actually went through the mound of dirt, and it was nothing more than a sound barrier that you see on the side of the highways. Right. So we lost family, family of neighbors. We lost nine people. And my father wanted to kill the man when he said, uh, when we told him, my father's hard of hearing, we waited until we got home to tell him, hey, they're not going to honor your uh, insurance policy. He said, why you didn't tell me when we were meeting with the man? I said, because you would have killed him. He would have wanted to at least kill him. And so uh, we fought that battle and we lost in the court. So to this day, you are not in good hands with Allstate. So that was my personal journey. Mm. So first off, I, I do want to say about New Orleans, uh, I was speaking with Soledad O'Brien earlier today. She said to tell you hello. She mentioned yes. that you took very good care of her on one particular trip, at least, to, to New Orleans. And you've served as sort of a maybe an unofficial ambassador of the city in, in many positive ways. You mentioned the, the homes that you've built and, and other ways that you've been involved in the community, representing it on film and, and television. What does the city, in more of a positive way, what has it meant to you and, you know, the pride that you take in representing it? New Orleans is one of the greatest examples of what is the best about the American aesthetic, that out of many, one, that, uh, that we have the malleability and the ability to adapt. That's one of the few things that gives you hopes in troubling times like now, is because we have the ability to know how to change, how and, and, and that's reflected in everything we do in New Orleans. Uh, the creation of jazz was that these, these enslaved Africans bringing a bambula from Africa, combining it with the brass music of Europe, and turning it into what is the American aesthetic, jazz. And why? They found their creative freedom before they found their physical freedom. Mm. They understood uh, New Orleans and all of its culture, and culture is the intersection of people and life itself, the literal intersection of how a people deal with this journey of life. That's culture. And at that intersection, they understood how to find freedom within form. In this particular instance with jazz, freedom within the form of the musical notes, a finite amount of notes, but an infinite amount of combinations. You yeah. have the structure of the chords of a song, but then you get to solo and create instantaneously any sort of expression that you want to, as long as you honor the chords of the song within that. And that is the American aesthetic. You know, it's, uh, we call ourselves a, late, a nation of laws because we have our freedom within those laws. You have the freedom to be the individual and speak your rights and ask for your rights and demand a redress of issues from your government, all within that confine of law and structure. But you have the freedom to be as individual as you want to be. And that's demonstrated in New Orleans music. That's demonstrated in New Orleans cuisine. Gumbo is literally scraps from the table. Literally, right, right, yeah. and you take some oil and some flour and you burn a roux and you take that scraps from the table that poor folks and enslaved folks took and built into a stew that has become world renowned. That people fly here from across the world to taste this stew of gumbo. Right. It's the reflection of how we approach life. David can tell you. You can tell the world, David, we sing when we talk. David, what's going on? Oh, come on, come on. Oh, you hear me? You know? right, right, right. Actually, trading fours in jazz is the emulation 
of the human voice, right? right? And so that is what New Orleans has contributed to the world. People come here because they see the nexus of what America is really all about. Out of many, one, when you see the dexterity of our constitution and why we praise it so much, is the fact that it's changeable. That's the thing that is great. Barbara Jordan said it the best. The Constitution was good. The 13th and 14th Amendment made it great, you know, when it was amended. And it's because you can amend it and understand that when you come to some sort of enlightenment and epiphany and understand that there's a better way of doing things, let's memorialize it in law and change this Constitution to move it forward. And that's where we're, we're in a moment right now. The zeitgeist that's happening around the world right now. What's interesting is it's going to happen around the world. We are the ones who actually can change it more than right now. I look at London. I spent the year in London. They can pull down some statues. Right. That's about it. We actually have already changed some chokehold laws and no, no knock warrants and defunding some of the, the militaristic side of policing. And nonviolent criminal calls are being in for mental illness or for domestic disputes are put into the hand of professionals who deal with that. They're trying to go down that way with arbitrators instead of someone who comes in violent. A wellness check does not have to end with a woman getting shot through her window like the young lady in Texas. So that's the thing that New Orleans has over the centuries as one of the biggest slave trading places in the world at the same time understanding that this is one of the first places that the civil rights movement started because Haitians came from, from a, a revolution in Haiti 40 years before the civil war here. And they taught Dessalon what insurrection was about. Right. And he led one of the greatest revolts. So a state, and, and we had the 1848 civil rights movement start here because they had a streetcar boycott and they had a Plessy versus Ferguson started here. He got on the train right there on Charter Street, at where my school was, and, and challenged separate but equal. One of the great cases uh, challenged in the Supreme Court, even though we lost the case, it was moving the movement forward of changing America. That is New Orleans, a political, cultural, culinary, musical, hotbed, and there's, we're so European, so that's the thing I love about New Orleans, Ricky. I'm talking too much, man. I'm going to give you... No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> this is great. Doubling down now on New Orleans, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago now, you were, you were in the news in your response to Drew Brees in particular mm -hmm. and how... He was viewing kneeling around the anthem and obviously terrible statement coming out of him and then arguably a worse apology following that. But your response in particular, I thought, just really hit it home in terms of, of your father, what he had done for this country and, and many like him. Just go into a little bit of that, what made you feel, you know, the need to sort of come forward and, and make that. Listen, I love Drew Brees, same reason I love David West. You see excellence. When you see someone who's a student of their craft and going to such a high level, it's just a great appreciation of it, you know? And Drew Brees, uh, I know we're going to look back on the time that he spent here in New Orleans and go, man, I saw one of the great quarterbacks that actually played this game, right? right? I, I was alive and I was able to watch him, you know? I never saw Babe Ruth play, but I saw Drew Brees play. I saw David West play. So I love Drew Brees. And that's why it hurt me the most. You know, when, when, you, when you hear... Someone you're close to, a friend or something, say something that just like uh, is so off track. I felt obligated to say something, even though I doubt he doesn't. He may know me, I don't know, but I felt obligated. It was a friend. You're on the wrong track. You're wrong. Right. You're wrong for that. My father fought in Saipan in World War II with the, uh, in a segregated unit attached to the Third Marines, risking his life for a country that he loved that wasn't loving him back. He literally could not go into the French Quarter in my beloved New Orleans. Mm. Uh, he literally could not go into a park in New Orleans except one day a week, Wednesdays, Negro Day. If you were caught in the park alone as a Negro any other day, you were arrested. Mm. Not talking about something that was a long time ago. This ended in the 60s with the Civil Rights Movement. 
<laughs> you know, so for the love of country that Drew was expressing, uh, why he was against someone kneeling, and he referenced his two grandfathers who had fought for that flag in World War II. And I was just like, uh, you know, you cannot then go on and use that banner where my father fought for that flag when that flag was actually whipping his ass. Right. Right. That endangered him. He was about to lose his life for a country that didn't respect his life. Hence, Black Lives Matter. Right. You know? And how dare you say that because of the, 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 um, the service of your grandfather's Drew Brees, that black men and white men should not, all men should not disgrace that flag by protesting. First of all, that's the first amendment of that great constitution that you so love. Free speech, freedom of the press, and the ability to protest and ask your government to address issues of grievance. It is the first Amendment. That's the only motherfucking amendment I know. Excuse me, this is a podcast. I can curse, right? You're good. <laughs> so it's like the very thing you're talking about, you're showing your hypocrisy right. and you're showing your ignorance because you don't know what the First Amendment is all about. Right. I hate the Klan. The Klan has the right to walk around, right? They have to walk around and do whatever they want, right? Because of the First Amendment. It make you feel you may feel uncomfortable seeing a brother kneel in protest, you know, perfect time because it brought all the attention to it. Right. What protest is about getting the attention. So it, it, it was, it worked. And here we are four years later, still having an impact. The accumulation of all those events, it's working that protest. How dare you? And I wanted, and then he was just, he was just wrong. He didn't understand the first amendment. It, he literally was wrong. Then it came to his Christianity. And then, you know, you showed your hypocrisy about your Christianity. First of all, you love your brother as yourself, so you'd be like, I wish they wouldn't do that, but I'm not going to tell somebody you can't do that. I feel that way about it. So you're wrong in that way. And to bring up Christianity, uh, the hypocrisy that's been in Christianity since its inception, right? right? I'm a black Catholic in New Orleans. I actually still go to church. Mm. Right? And I still go to church because I, I treat the Catholic Church just like I treat America. You know, it's like a drunken parent. I love you, but you know, I don't <laughs> when you drink. You know, right, right, right. misuse, right? right. Uh, when you think about it, you know, people go, yeah. "How can you love an abusive parent?" Yes, I'm conflicted. Right. There's, there's some days that you just see the beauty of it. You know, right. I actually just love the quiet of church. Just like, oh, one day a week, I just get to chill. You know. Even right. think about going to church, I chill. I don't always go. I just sit there and go, oh, now I'm going to get up and go to church. Oh, just right, right. 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 No, actually, I'm going to go back to sleep. That just relaxed me real nice. But right. the hypocrisy of his statement and calling on his Christianity, saying that he can't do it. Right. The hypocrisy of the national anthem, not only for the NFL, because the NFL actually gets paid. Because the right. national anthem only came into the games when, when the Army... And the military said, we want to recruit. Right. And so funny, yeah. and the NFL said, fine, you recruit every game. Right. We'll play the national anthem. And like naming rights on a goddamn stadium, they said, right. but motherfucker, for you to play the national anthem, you got to pay the NFL. <laughs> right, right, right. So, right. so you know, right. so then I remember an incident that my father, who fought for that flag at a time when the flag did not respect him or this country didn't respect him, didn't honor his voting rights, didn't honor him a right to live wherever he wanted. It was that Moses generation that gave us this legacy as a mm -hmm. Joshua generation to move on and fight, fight and protest. We went to Friday night fights. Mm -hmm. We stood up and it was during the Black Power Movement in the 70s and some brothers in, foot of, in front of us pulled his, his leg. I said, man, sit down, pops. He goes, hey man, don't touch me. He said, man, sit down. Pops, what y'all standing for the national anthem, for the flag? Sit down, man. Black power. He said, man, don't touch me. He said, I actually fought for that flag. Oh, man, Lord have mercy. That, that's some bullshit. Sit down, Pops. He said, man, you touch my leg one more time, I'm going to kick in your teeth. He said, now, I fought for that flag so you can sit your ass down. And so I thought of that, right? How my father was, like, supporting their protest. Right. Saying, I'm choosing to stand. But I fought for that flag so you can sit down. So do that, young blood. 
sit down. That's your way of speaking. Right now, for me, I want to stand up. And we all, you know, we're all working in concert. We're not working in competition. Do your thing. Right. He said, I'll kick your teeth and you touch my leg again. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought of that. And that's what made me end my letter to Drew Brees. I said, my father cheers for you every Sunday as you stand up. Now, hopefully you can cheer for him if he wants to kneel down in front of that flag. I often make the point about people using those qualifiers. So I had a, I took issue with what Drew said as well, because I feel like you, right? Like you, you admire Drew Brees, right? He got all the bad rap about being small and the size of his hands, came to New Orleans, won Super Bowls, one of the all-time greats. And then when you realize that they're so, they're so closed off to what the actual reality is, it's kind of disappointing. I always feel a, a certain way when people make qualifiers. Like when you talk about what made him say, well, my grandfather's fought. It's as if black people didn't do these things, right? It's, right. it's when they say, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a veteran, I'm a this, I'm a that. We are those things. Right. It, 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 you're absolutely right, David. The thing that pisses me off, the thing that pisses me off, really, it may be Ricky as, a, as, a, as the new word, as the ally, right? Right. Maybe you can hit, hit me to this. I actually don't think they're closed off to. That's the thing that pisses me off the most. Mm. Everybody's like, oh, I want to listen. I was like, no, motherfucker, you don't have to listen because you already know. Because you're too intelligent. You're too salient a human being to tell me that you didn't know all this shit was going on. When you saw it, when you had the racist uncle in the corner at, you know, telling nigga jokes at Thanksgiving, right. you say, hey, Uncle Sal, don't say, you know, don't say, I have to put, listen, because we know it in our own family. Like, you have to put somebody in check, you know. Right. And that, that little faggot, hey, Matt, bro, we can't say that. Oh, here we go, Wendell, with all of that shit, right, man. Right, right. You know, I'm like, no, bro, we got to put that shit in check, you know. Right. You, you got to put that shit in check. You, would, you wouldn't want nobody calling you a nigga. Right. I'm not going to let you sit here and call that cat a faggot. Oh, this my, right? So my own experience tells me that all of these people that go, oh, wow, I'm coming to an understanding of everything that you've been going through. And I'm looking around and I know and maybe I'm through the institutional racism and stuff. You're not coming to an understanding of that. You're letting go of your denial. But I want you to listen because right. you know, you've known all the time. If you don't know, you are either one of the stupidest motherfuckers out right. there <laughs> or one of the most naive. Right. Because people know. Folks know. Folks know. You can just think of your own experience. You know those C-plus students or that <laughs> the cat who's like, <laughs> you just go, man. Bruh, the only reason you here is because your daddy owns this company, right? right. The only reason you here is you really can't play. You really can't play, but it's putting some some butts in the seats and management like, right. hey, play that cat, right? right? And I know coaches come in there like, man, listen, I want you to get some rest, David, because uh, all of a sudden you play hard. David West is a you know he's always ready to fight, but yet Lambeer does it. Ah, oh, he's a warrior, right? Right. right. You know, Stephen James. You know, oh, the, the brawl in the mall or whatever. Right, right, right. You know, uh, in, in, in Pontiac. You know, he and our test are just out of hand. Right. They're, you know, thugs and all of that, you know. Kevin McHale does the shit. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And right. close by somebody coming down, <laughs> coming right. down the lane. You know, oh, boy, he's, he's an enforcer. So we all know that, you know. Right. Yeah. I remember one time I was trying to catch a cab in Chicago, man, you know, and they're passing by the by. And I, as a joke on Rush Street, I just turned to this group of folks and I said, hey, man, would you come, would one of you kind of white folks hail, hail the brother a cab? And the guy goes, yeah, man, I'm sorry about that. Real nice cat. And his girlfriend said, what do you mean? I don't understand. And he said, shut up. I said, oh, man, you don't have to talk. He said, no, man, how can she say some shit like that? He said, I don't understand. Why do you have to hail a cab for him? And he understood all the racial implications of what was happening. And he was right. so pissed off that his girlfriend was both stupid mm. and naive, right? right? Most people are like the man who held me. Like most people, at least my friends, when they call me, Wendell, you know, in these times, I want to listen. I'm like, no, man, no, you don't want to listen. You need to give up any denial you have. Right. That's what it's about. So those qualifiers are the red flags of all those denials. Right. That he grew up in Texas. Come right. on. He grew up in Texas. He knew he knew what the deal was. And and everyone who says all lives matter, all lives matter. 
you know? And the folks, I understand the folks that can't stand it. And they're cutting up the signs, right? right. I actually now think that they were shooting at the protests and stuff like that, right? Because <laughs> that sort of patriarchal supremacist system that has benefited them forever is coming to an end. And they had a tape I saw recently where this woman called this sister a nigga because she cut her off. Mm-hmm. And, then she went, and she drove to the police station <laughs> to say, she cut me off and she's filming me. Right, I saw that. And there's, watch that again, David, the most telling moment in, the, in that. And I actually, I know what she's going through. As a student of human behavior, as an actor, that white woman, elderly, Old puts her head down. She said, I can't take it. All of this that's going on. She knows the world is changing around her. And what has benefited her forever, she's afraid of the unknown. Wow. She's afraid of the unknown and like, what's going to happen? She just, I can't take it. That's what's happening. It's the fact, think of South Africa right before. I mean, that's what it's all about. The other thing is, some people don't want it to change, so there's knowledge of it. They're like, I don't want this to change. And I have rationalized this behavior long enough that it's acceptable to me because I don't see it as a death. All he had to do was comply. All he had to do, why was he running? Walter Scott, why was he running? Anything like that. Uh, it's the perception of you. You, I raise my voice, I'm a troublemaker. If a white colleague raises their voice, they're a maverick. And that, that distinction is not unknown to the people who perpetrate that injustice, right? They know it. Those qualifiers that you hear are the denial, the rationale. And because I'm actually a low human being for shooting people in their back, that I can't go, let him run. I got his car right. and his license. <laughs> he ain't going that far, right. right? But the fact that he ran and he fought them is an insult. And listen, I understand policing. I understand what the deal is. If somebody fights for your gun, yes, it's a life and death battle. Once he breaks away, you have your guns and you already know he doesn't because you've already checked it. Because at first, with the shooting in Atlanta, I said, hey, people, lay. you got to give the cops the benefit of the doubt there, man. Right. That turns around, he points something at it. You don't know if that's a gun or not. And then I saw all the earlier tapes and I was like, wait a minute. They had him in complete control. They knew that he didn't have a gun. So if you think he's running and now he turns around and he has a gun, then you're saying that you were incompetent in searching. So if he does have a gun, you put your own life at risk. But you know he doesn't have a gun. And now that taser, but he has a taser and he fires it and it has a little... Well, if it's non-lethal in the cop's hand, why is it now lethal in his hand? Right. We all know that shit. And sometimes I, I get frustrated you know, I've done so many of these recently. That's why I'm going on and on and on. And I apologize. I don't know how long your podcast. You're good, man. You're good. You're good. And I, you know, I would tell people, I'm, I'm tired of talking about this shit. I'm tired of talking about it. And if I'm tired of talking about it, imagine how tired we are of experiencing it. Experiencing it, right? So I also tell people, don't talk without action going hand in hand with it, because a part of the distraction is keep them talking, keep them protesting. That feigned naivete that those who do not have our best interests at heart. Because I actually think they understand everything that we're talking about. They understand all of our grievances. They know where it's come from. They Mm. understand the historical nature of it. They understand that that ignorance, that racism, that virulent violence, murderous racism that was a part of slavery just changed in Reconstruction and became Jim Crow, which changed now has become mass incarceration. Man, I just learned about cash bails recently, where if your bail is 78 and you come with $80, you can't get out because you have to have exact change. <laughs> yeah. You know somebody who put that in law is like, man, we got to figure out a way to keep these motherfuckers in jail. Right. So if they And we make a cash bail, and if they don't have the exact amount of right. bail money, we get to keep them in. Right. That's intentional. They Very intentional. Most people don't know that. If you come in and say, hey, man, your bail is 75 and you come there with $80, I'm, this is for my boy David West, get him out. I'm not going to put that on you. I'm going to put it on Ricky. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get Ricky out. My boy Ricky has $80. No, it's 75 So, hey, no, we don't have change. No, keep the change. I want my boy Ricky out. No, you have to give $75. Did you know that? I did not know that. 
I just found that out. And if you don't have $75, then you're in. And that's it. Your ass stays in jail. And the first thing, I got some of the PPP money for my businesses, right? The first thing they asked is, have you been arrested? First thing they asked. The only time I got a call from the SBA, because I have been arrested, uh, about this arrest, <laughs> you know? Right. Everything else was electronic. But they said, about this arrest. And I explained it and all of that. And I oh, okay, cool. And then I was able to get the loan. But it really was interesting to see that when people feign that ignorance, it's because they are trying to justify and rationalize perpetuating that ignorance. Mm. And people cutting up the signs and they're on the way out, man. Right. On the way out. Did you know? Okay, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to get off this soapbox. This is the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to let you ask another question. Did you know? I just found out what it was. They were, inter- uh, they were interviewing a neo Nazi guy from the Charlottesville. He exposed me to something I hadn't realized. The reason he was so anti Hillary Clinton was he was so mad at white women. And the reason he was mad at white women is because they have not procreated enough to keep us in the majority. Wow. And I did not know that that was a part of the white supremacist mentality now, that they're mad at white women because now in a few years, we are going to be the majority minority. And it's because white women didn't have enough white babies. And that was a part- I didn't know that. I didn't know that. (laughs) And that blew me away. That blew me Uh, away. Because of the pro-choice- uh, because you're dating outside of your race. Oh, uh, okay. And so because of that, we, we, you haven't been procreating enough and having enough white children to keep us in the minority, in the majority. Wow. Yeah, that, they just made the jump that she's representing this group of people that haven't yeah. done their, their job, so to speak, done in his job. eyes. Wow. We have lifted you as a white woman on your pedestal. I'm like, and you're dating and marrying, you know. Wow. So as a student of human behavior, all of this stuff has come up in these past couple of days and weeks. So now, take the lesson from that Moses generation, my father's generation, listening to him. My father had one response. He can't hear shit. He goes, what's going on? Oh, listen. <laughs> we explained to him what was happening. He goes, oh, 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 okay. We're going to take care of this shit. And that was it. I was like, that's all you have to do? We're going to take care of this shit. What he meant in that statement was, we have shown in every instance in generations to step up to the plate to do the things necessary to make this shit forward. The abolition movement and slavery, uh, the civil rights movement in the mid 20th century to get out of Jim Crow. Now this movement, even the beginnings of this as we try to end mass incarceration. And now that we have the zeitgeist, the attention of the world focused on, let's really get to the bones of where this racism has actually destroyed all of us, right? right? Not the impact it has on our community, but how it has hampered you from actually being as successful a society mm-hmm. as you want to be. And we're showing you how it's institutionalized. And let's change it within the institution, you know? And that, that is what is lurching us forward right now. And people are going to fight that. This change right. always come with the fight. And here's the other thing we have to, I don't subscribe to. Racism doesn't end. People are like, we're going to end racism. I'm like, no, we're not going to end it. You have to look at it like cancer. We're trying to put it in, back into remission because it's an ugly part of human nature. And so we're trying to put you back into remission. But I think sports-wise, I think it's the opportunity now with the NCAA to cut that shit out. That is, what they're doing is criminal in the NCAA. To call the NBA out on that one and done rule. Right. Oh, we're not gonna accept any kids out of high school anymore because the NCAA called them and said, "Can we get one? Get those cats right. just for one year? That's all I need to make that fifty million dollars in March madness. <laughs> I just need one year. Right. Give me that Carmelo Anthony for one year at Syracuse. That's all I need because right. we're gonna make thirty to fifty million dollars in that one March madness run, and then I can make that run at my university. And universities always push back, and the NCAA, well, no, we pay players." You know, we're giving them an invaluable degree. <laughs> right, right. And I'm like, show me one degree from your university where they're going to go to the MBA and generate just well, how many, 200 men are going to generate right. billions in a couple of months. You right. show me that degree that does that. And then, I'll, and then I'll say, all right, don't pay the players. If you, if you care about the players, 
why did you give up your television contract? What do you think about this moment? So what, you know, I know you talked about using the power of this moment. So what, what do you think, what kind of energy do you think can be you know, galvanized in this moment? Like we, you know, what, what, the work that we're doing, we're trying to end exploitation at the collegiate basketball level. I know that, you know, the last few weeks I've been talking with NBA players and trying to help them sort out what they are doing. You know, they're going to come with some demands and some ideas about employment and different opportunities for black employment, not just in terms of the players level, but at the executive level and ownership and things like that. So Absolutely. what do you think, what do you think that opportunity looks like in terms of just taking advantage of this moment? First of all, they have to work concurrently. Protest and keeping keeping the moment front and center is what protest is about. It's the PR of the movement, right? So keep that going. Now let's talk about where the rubber meets the road. Paid collegiate athletes, they should be profit participation in all television contracts, period. The model is already there in my profession. Go to the Screen Actors Guild, I get profit participation. I'm in a hit show. The hit show, not only I get my salary, but I get a percentage. I get residuals. That's what should be because guess what? You're making money off of a television show. That's all NCA is, a television show. Yeah, they want to tell you. Whenever I hear somebody, I love college athletes more than, <laughs> oh, I'm like, oh, so you buying that bullshit. That bullshit is about, oh, it's the tailgating and school spirit and all of that. I'm like, yeah, if it's about that, why don't y'all give away the money, the $20 million you're going to make at the national championship game? Where does that money go? Then they say, well, wonder if we do that, what about the women's sports, uh, you know, field hockey? I said, you eat the cake that you bake. If the women's field hockey team can go to a PBS station in their town and say, hey, listen, why don't you broadcast our field hockey games? And let's do a participation with the revenue you get from that. If they can convince somebody to do that, then that's fine. If I generate it, I should participate in it. That's the first thing. The second thing is two athletes came up with it from UCLA years ago. If you want the students to stay there, put their portion of the money into escrow. If they stay and graduate, when they graduate, they get that money on graduation. If they leave early and go pro, then you get the money at the university. But in the meantime, set it aside and put it in escrow and let it grow, interest and all of that. And those 53 players, I'll, you know, or 12 when it comes to basketball, they get theirs upon graduation. That incentivizes that student to go, you know, something I could go pro, but you know, you know man, I'm, a, I'm not even gonna be drafted, but right. I don't have to go overseas. Well, I'm getting a part of March Madness, CBS money, some of the CBS money. But that incentivizes me to stay maybe longer and incentivizes me to go, you know something? Yo, come on, David. Post up, man. We can beat these cats because if we make it to the final four, we really going to get paid. Right. <laughs> right. Profit participation. That's right. how you do it. I also learned something. I'm just talking collegiate. The reason they don't do it, I thought it was about the money. They're, they're ready for that. But once they do that, then they become an employee. employee. And what happens is the employee, that kid who gets hurt, that knee injury, that's workman's comp. So for yeah. the life of that injury, which they know is going to go past those four years they're at the university, they have to pay for it. Right. Now, my whole thing is I understand that. So maybe we can put a cap on it so, you can, so we can meet middle ground in the middle right 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 so instead of the lifetime of the injury give me 10 years to become a man or a woman who has a decent enough job that i'm going to have some health care that i'll be right. able to take care of this so won't right. you cover me for the, instead of the lifetime of the injury for a decade of the injury and then your obligations of workman comp sunsets that's the one thing you do mm -hmm. see now all of this you're getting into the weeds you know you're talking about uh bargaining and everything and everything that the unions do in the pro level. But yeah, well, that's what it is. But in the meantime, as that is puts somebody to sleep, right? That's what the protest is about. Pay the students, pay collegiate athletes, right, get right. slavery, <laughs> right? Because that's what NCAA is doing, it's slavery. Because it's slavery. they're getting paid. And what they do is, so some cats, I'm gonna get your mama a house, I'm gonna do this. 
It's like, why are you going to force yet again young black people into a black market economy? I, I go on the corners in New Orleans and I say, man, if I could get you a house, get you a job that can pay for you for a house, and you get you a car, you could take your old lady out on the weekends and movies and dinners and shit like that, would you get off this corner slinging? He goes, yeah, man, shit. Why you think I'm out here? Right, right, right. So that's the logic of it. So when you aren't allowed to be a part of the regular economy, you are forced into an underground economy. And people sit there and go, what? I don't understand why the drug trade is in the black community. Man, shit, I can't go downtown and get a job in your Wall Street firm. You're telling me the minute I walk in, I'm not smart enough. The fact that you may see Kaleem on my resume, you go, man, Kaleem Washington, that sound black. I'm going to toss that resume before he even walks in here. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not giving that opportunity. Men and women will seek a way to thrive. So it's an underground economy. I don't subscribe to it. I don't promote it. But then I'm not stupid enough not to realize that that's where it comes from. It's the same thing in collegiate athletes. So you're not allowing me to get paid from this humongous television contract. You don't want to pay me. You don't want to put it in escrow. You don't want to pay workman comp. You don't want to give me any health insurance, anything. Because the minute I leave school, you're going to go, that you don't have use of our doctors. So you're going to force those athletes to then go, man, I'm not going to live like that. I'm going to go pro, right? Then you have the collusion of the pro leagues saying, no, David West can't leave straight from high school and come into the NBA. He has to do at least one year. I forgot what school you went to, college. Xavier, Xavier in Ohio. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to force him to go to the Midwest school right there, right? So now David, ooh, David West, I'm not, I shouldn't use you as an example. I don't <laughs> want to try to do a podcast or something. But again, they go, yeah, you know, you get the you get the thousand dollar handshake from a booster. Good game. Right. Oh shit! <laughs> you know, right. uh, my man got trouble uh, in L.A. Plays for USC. How how I love it? I love it. Grab right, him and right, shit. Right. He was at the club, right? It's like now you guys they make you look like you're the thief, you're the criminal. When the real criminality is the fact that they get in from September to December in a short period of time in football. They make a hundred million dollars, <laughs> right? And these few athletes, these fifty student athletes, generate a hundred billion dollars. Where coaches are getting paid fifteen million a year. What the hell are you doing? Right, right. Saban hasn't played. I never saw Nick Saban catch a ball, throw it, right. run, catch, tackle. Right? He's a good, good PR. You know what's my man at Clemson? He, he Devil. 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 <laughs> You know, all I have to do, all I have to do is make sure I sound good right. and entertain it. And if I sound good and entertain it, all them boys are going to want to come play for me. Right? Right. He gives you press conference. You'd be like, right. man, shit, let me go get one of them orange shirts and shit. I'm right. like, <laughs> he sells merchandise and shit. How does it make a kid feel when he looks up in the stand and see 100,000 people wearing his jersey that he knows they dropped $200 for and his, his family is hurting or he's hurting at school? And then he's to be made... Uh, to feel guilty for considering going pro early. You can leave now? Leave now? So it's bullshit. So that's what the podcast is about, right? Yeah. You're all good, man. And, and that's what it's yeah. about. So that so that's how we take advantage of it, to change that system now. Right. Profit sharing or escrow accounts where folks can go and go pro if they want to or pay them. They'd be surprised at how many people stay longer if they actually gave them profit sharing in the television market, the money that they're making, right? Yeah. And all the arguments against it are bullshit. All of them are bullshit. On the pro side, do the same thing. Negotiating that selective bargaining agreement, CBA. Right. Is that here's the deal. A portion of this, we have some profit sharing. Or here's the time for the NBA. We're going to be like baseball. There's fewer players. But all of our shit is guaranteed. All of our shit is guaranteed. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. That three on three has shown you that, hey, NBA says, hey, you're the only thing out there. That's like, actually, that three on three showing us that if we all stepped away right now, we can create our own. There's either going to be some more profit sharing for us. I would say on the NBA side, because I think it's baseball is the only one that is all guaranteed, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. NBA, guaranteed money. Guaranteed contract. That's what it should be. Guaranteed contract. Because there's only how many players on each team? 15. 
15 and then, yeah, 15 max on the bench, and then you got some uh, practice squad cast, right? right? right. So, say 20. 20, and it's 32 teams or something? I don't know. I keep getting confused. 30. Yeah. 30. Yeah. So we're talking about 600, 600 men that generate that wealth in the NBA. You know, you each should be billionaires, right? Mm-hmm. Think about it. You say we should negotiate towards that. A community benefit agreement should be made in every city that they have. So mm. let's take one to two to three percent of our marketing budget and put it in an empowerment zone that we get to dictate where it is. Where are you from originally, David? Teaneck, New Jersey. Teaneck. So okay, so you know Teaneck. We all know Teaneck. Right. You know, so you you can create your own empowerment zone. Right. They can get together and say, you know something, I want this shit to go to Newark, where Teaneck is. You know, on the east side, what's the shit on Long Island? The cats can play some balls. Or well, that's well, that's some. Some hard motherfuckers, man. Hempstead, Hempstead, yeah. Hempstead. You, you know, right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know, you'd be like, man, I hope we beat them, and then I hope we don't see them in the parking lot. Right? They actually, yeah, they actually, I swear, man, they came to New Jersey one time, they came to Teaneck and ran us smooth off our own floor. <laughs> right. Hempstead, so man, you, Hempstead yeah, was no yeah, joke. Play and, and play some hard care. So you can create your own empowerment zones that you can then demand the NBA to invest in this community. I like that. I like that. Started in Chicago. And here's the thing about it. It's called a community benefit agreement. Started by many groups a long time ago. So, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. Somebody, the Staples Center did it for the community around where the Staples Center came. They said, all those neighborhood associations said, you're going to have an impact on us. So, right. like Chavez regime, uh, Ravine did with the Dodgers in the 50s, where you just moved all these Mexican-Americans off of their property mm. and took it. No, you coming in with the Staples Center, it's going to have an adverse effect. We want a community benefit agreement. We want 2% of your budget of the Lakers. Mm-hmm. And they got it. They got it. So we can do that. Where the NBA does community benefit agreements in all 30 cities that they have, we know where, this, where it is. Right. right Here, right. I would tell them the empowerment zone is the lower ninth ward. Right. right? right. And so we take 2% of the budget of the Pelicans and say, that's what your commitment is from our organization. There, the players, we want guaranteed contracts now. Well, guaranteed because it's only fifteen men on each team, right? And the and the money that we bring in, and the money that one person who gets to the level of a of a LeBron or a, a, a MJ or whatever, right, right. MJ generated a billion dollars on his return from baseball. A billion dollars <laughs> was the economic impact of his return in. Three or four months, a billion dollars to all the surrounding businesses, all of that. So you go, hey, man, I have that impact as, a, as the NBA. I love what you're doing, and we're going to make that commitment. Miami's going to do that in Liberty City. The Pelicans right. are going to do that in the lower ninth ward. Don't come and just put another damn court up with your logo, right, for a photo op with the players. And I think that's the demand that the players from Empowerment zones, they've already been designated. People already know how it works, and they're already out there that the NBA can say, here's the deal. Then you can go to other organizations, uh, go to the Black Chamber of Commerce and say, this is what we want to create in this community. Here, identify the lawyer who wants to open his office here. Identify the small business owner who wants to bring a grocery store here. We have money like that designated in the farm bill so we can get rid of food deserts. I tried to do one here that lasted about two years, a grocery Mm -hmm. store and underserved communities, then those empowerment zones can then money from the NBA that the players have demanded that they have a community benefit agreement in our city here. And it, does, it, it we're going to take it above, oh, we're going to do another playground in the hood. We're going to donate 50 balls to this AAU squad. We're going to pay for the uniform. No, no, no. What we're going to do is going to come in with a strategic economic plan for the South Side of Chicago, strategic economic plan for the Four Ninth Ward in New Orleans, strategic economic plan for Liberty City. And here's the thing. We're going to bring those businesses in because the social justice movement of the 21st century is economic development. Listen to me, gentlemen. The social justice movement of the 21st century is economic development. And mm-hmm. that is the thing that empowers you. The social justice movement of the 20th century was Political advocacy, march on Washington, change the laws, all of that. We're not working in competition with that. We're extending that and working in concert. So now economic development. So now these men of the NBA can say, we'll play. 
but community benefit agreements with in your city. We can designate everybody can know, everybody knows. Sacramento, everybody knows. It's the east side. Right. Everybody knows. Right. Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, Liberty City in Miami, Teaneck, Hempstead, right. Newark, right. for Brooklyn right. Nets, and for the Knicks. Right? right. We all know. Align yourself with the National Urban League, which is as a registry of black businesses. Give them that stop city to come in there, then politically go to the communities legislative branch and make it a TIF zone. A TIF zone is a tax-free zone for the first five or 10 years of that business. It's not in business is your payroll and your sales tax when it's retail and taxes in general. You make it a tax-free zone, then that generates business in a community that you haven't had generating business in a long time because you've ignored it, even though you have an office of economic development. That's how you make the rubber meet the roll in the NBA and in the NCAA. Mm-hmm. And then protest again. Then it's not just on the David West Foundation and, you know, the <laughs> right. Draymond Green Foundation, where brothers always have to do that so they can kind of like have some sort of tax break or whatever. No, man. And here's the other thing with the NBA to show the power. Also, every team contribute to a expansion fund, right? So that the next expansion team. When that fund builds up, it goes to a minority owner. Boom. Boom. Goes to Maybe a minority taking owner. notes. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking notes. <laughs> I'm going to minority going right to the minority <laughs> owner. Players are going to get it. Oh, my God. Yeah. A minority owner. That's the first ask. A community benefit agreement for those communities. Fund empowerment zones in each of the 30 cities that they're in. And fourth, contributing to an expansion fund that when it hits uh, the target, that that money subsidizes a minority owner with the next expansion team. Mm. Or, or make it twofold, a former player and minority owner, if you want to keep it within the, in the family. Right. But definitely minority owner. That's a good one. Mutually beneficial. The whole time, the whole people are like, why I'm subsidizing that? Why I'm subsidizing? We're subsidizing you all the time. Do you know that the welfare system in this country that with all the people and the government, you know who controls the EBT? Mm-mm. JP Morgan or, uh, or, or Chase. They have a they have an administrative fee of like nine million dollars a month. And I'm going, wait a minute, we have a whole health and human services department of government. We have enough employees to, to do that. Why are we outsourcing the administration of welfare checks to a bank? To Chase, I think it's either Chase or J.P. Morgan. And why? It's because that's the corruption that people who got in government say, okay, cool. They cut welfare. They cut welfare. It's called workfare. You got to work now to get that check, all of that stuff. And they cut it. We're not just going to give it out. Yeah. Reform welfare. And a part of that reformation was to give private industry a check to administer it. They just took the money from the people and gave it to their friends. That's the hustle. That's the hustle. And so what happens is, you know the hustle and you know the power that you have. Know your worth and value as NBA players and as collegiate players. I wish one day some collegiate blue chip player would be like, you know something? This university is doing this and I don't understand those practices and all of that stuff. I'm not going to go to that university. I'm purposely not going to go to the university. And if I'm going to bring some benefit to the university and not get something back, I'm going to go to a university that I want to bring that benefit to. So therefore, I am not going to put on the hat of the uh, University of Michigan as I thought I would. I'm actually going to Bethune-Cookman. <laughs> to right, right. You know? You're like, right. what? Then everybody would say, oh, no, they're not going to take you in the NBA. I mean, in the <laughs> NFL, if you go and play for that small black school, nobody's going to look at you. Nobody's going to see you. And then they got two words. Then you come back with two words. Jerry Rice. <laughs> Two more words. Doug Williams. <laughs> right? Basically the entire NFL in the 70s. <laughs> right. You know. so, all right. Yeah. I'm getting on my soapbox, man. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I would be remiss if I missed the opportunity to at least bring up the wire momentarily and bunk Moreland. So, again, another one of your Twitter threads. Uh, semi-recently, I forget the, the author that brought it up, but within the context of everything that's going on, 
you know, trying to in some way, shape or form, I guess, protest the viewing of The Wire. Loved your response to it. Uh, I'm just, I'm interested, you know, I know my thoughts and feelings, but just kind of summarizing why The Wire in a lot of ways lays out exactly reality that we're experiencing right now. Yeah, what happens is uh, that was in response to an article that says that, you know, all television cop shows glorify policing. And I said, if you could look at The Wire and think that we would glorify policing, I think you, you missed the importance of The Wire. The Wire was showing the, the dysfunction of policing, the dysfunction of our political system. It was showing all the things that contributed to the detriment of community, like the war on drugs is really just a, a war on poor people and poor people of color and uh, mass incarceration. That's what it's about. The Wire was the canary in the mine to show people that this is what's going to happen in our communities if you don't change your ways. Um, uh, David Simon said that directly to President Obama. He said, listen, you know, this the war on drugs was uh, a political propaganda you know, to say we're, you know, getting rid of the bad drugs in neighborhoods and all, but really it's just mass incarceration. And then we all know that mass incarceration is just modern day slavery because of so many companies that get to use, uh, look at the film 13, get to use the labor in prison for their products. And that goes all the way back to slavery. I mean, Angola here in Louisiana is a working plantation, mm. it's a working plantation where the inmates actually farm the agriculture there to be sold for the profit to go to Louisiana, the state of Louisiana. And that's just a, a working plantation. That's all it is. And, uh, and we all know that mass incarceration was the answer to um, the emancipation proclamation. Right. Like, okay, we can't enslave them. So now there's the loophole in the 13th Amendment, which is you have all the rights of being a human being and a citizen of the United States. Uh, but you lose those rights if you get incarcerated. Right. So all we have to do is just incarcerate, you know? Um, so, and that's the master plan. In Louisiana, you can literally get an inmate to come and cut your lawn. This is what the wire was exposing and how the individual is lost in, in the institution. An individual tries to change it, the institution is always fighting against that to give a few men ease at the detriment of every, everyone else. Also in The Wire, I hope that uh, some of the message of the good side, another messaging, not a good side or whatever, just another perspective. All the black cops I studied with and the real bunk, who was a real man, author of Queer, became police as African-Americans because the crime that was in their neighborhood wasn't reflected of the people that lived in the neighborhood. It was a small percentage, 1%. So the, one percent was having an adverse effect on so many others in the community. And they became policemen because they wanted to reflect what it meant for all of those other people, the Mr. Joes and Miss Anns that they grew up with, and these hardworking people who are going out and working every day, the working poor, who, um, who are disproportionately affected as victims when it comes to crime. So they, they want, they became, so many black officers became policemen because they wanted to reflect that in the community. And that is the, is the impetus of the scene that I have with Omar in the wire. Mm -hmm. You remember what this neighborhood was like, right? So, because we're some, we're from the same neighborhood. We went to the same high school, everything. Yeah, you know, here I'm a police officer and he's a, you know, a homicidal uh, maniac. <laughs> but uh, who had? But it shows you. It shows you the moral ambiguity. You know, uh, Omar is a beloved uh, uh, a character from The Wire as this homicidal uh, maniac, really, uh, who had principles. You know, I don't kill. We don't kill on Sundays. He did not curse. You know, you, he came. They came for his grandmother. You never go for somebody's family members. Right. So you know, it's all of those. Um, even criminals have some have principle, you know, or you saw cops who didn't have principle. McNulty just making up a mass murder at the end of the, you know, just trying to get more uh, overtime play. So it just showed the moral ambiguity that is so rife in all of our institutions. And if we don't deal with it, it's going to be self-destructive. It's going to be the, it is the decline of the American aesthetic.
instead of the raising up of the American aesthetic. And that's what The Wire was all about. You can never pass a corner kid again and not see their humanity. Right. You can never look at that cop again and not know that they know better and right. that, that there is a better way. And so you have every right to challenge them. That's what I wanted to say earlier, especially when it comes to rights. When you walk into a McDonald's and you see the cats with the AR-15 or AK-47 strapped on their back and they're walking through grocery stores and everything, you're like, man, can you not have an assault rifle? Say, man, I have a Second Amendment right to carry this. They're unapologetic about it. That's the way we need to be. Unapologetic. Be unapologetic about your rights. Exercise your right of self-determination. It is not my job to explain to you why it's best. That Second Amendment cat doesn't explain to me why it's best that we respect his Second Amendment right. He doesn't go, well, let me tell you, let me explain to you. If I have the right to bear this arms, then this and this. He says, I have the right. He's unapologetic about it. We, are the, we should be the same way when it comes to our rights. We pay the police officer. You can come with all your hero worship all you want. Oh, they're doing a job. Hey, man, you sleep. nobody drafted you. You went and signed up at the academy. And guess what? Even the poorest person in this country pays that policeman's salary. They work for you. If the, even the undocumented in this country pays his salary because they pay sales tax. When you buy a soda, you pay for a cop. So don't be apologetic about it. Right. You will not behave this way. Oh, well, the police, I'm not going to come in. Well, don't fucking come in. We're going to get somebody else. The other thing that I want to promote when it comes to policing that, uh, so the moral ambiguity was shown in the wire. Some, my belief is if you have the, you earn the right to complain if you come up with a solution. That's why when you say, well, what should we do in the NBA and the NCAA? Right. God damn, when it went down a litany of shit, he's been thinking about this. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely right. And it's the same thing with policing. We know what we need to do, get rid of chokeholds, get rid of no warrant, all of that. We need a registry of bad cops so they can't just leave Teaneck and then come down to New Orleans. And go right, out. right. We all know, we, we know that. Here's the other thing. We need cops living in our community, right? This is something that I've promoted for years post-Katrina. You have blighted properties all over. Incentivize people by saying, if you become a police officer, you will get a one or 2% loan automatically. The day, the day you graduate as a cop, you have a house. That mortgage comes from the city coffers, right? From the city treasury. So the city acts as the mortgage bank, lends it to the new cop. The cop is paying the city back with interest. So the cop is almost paying for his, paying his way. And in return, he gets a house. But you tie it to a blighted property. You tie it to a blighted property in the South Bronx or the Lower Ninth Ward here. What's going to happen is that one cop that doesn't live in the community, right? They're not going to want to live there. But all of a sudden, cats who are in the community, you know, man, I have a car. I could get a house. And I'm, you know, I'm ducking bullets now for just $1,000 in my pocket. Let me dodge bullets as a cop. <laughs> I have a house, and I'm still living in my neighborhood. Right. Right? So all of a sudden, these blighted, underserved communities have officers of the law that they know as their neighbors and living in their community. Their community. So we don't have to have this fight about the residence clause. And now you take care of reformation of police. You take care of issues of finance, mm. right? Supplementing your police budget because the half of your police are paying their mortgage right back to the city government. Community policing is now a part of life because the cop lives in the community. And we don't have to have the fight about um, a residency clause that we have in every city, right? In Cleveland, all the cops are living in Shaker Heights, right? <laughs> in New York, all the cops are living on Long Island. Right. In New Orleans, all the cops are living on the North Shore. So all of a sudden they come to the hood, all they know is I'm living in the lap of luxury. I'm scared of every motherfucker walking the streets over here. So somebody says, boo, I'm going right. to shoot. Because I've been told, hey, man, they come in from a place of fear. So as a student of human behavior, I understand why they shoot. It doesn't justify it. You should be held accountable. But now you wonder why cops are shooting for the smallest thing or whatever. Why are you sitting there seeing 
a six foot two black man, everything is told to you that a six foot two black man is a threat. That's all you know. And you coming from outside of the community that you know nothing about. I actually had a CBS executive ask us, do black people kiss their kids? A CBS executive, when I was on the show, he asked that, do black people kiss their kids? So you're coming with that sort of ignorance? So you already dehumanized me. So you're, But if you live in the community, then you can change. And we showed that on the wire. Prez Belowski shooting a black cop, right? All of that stuff. You come from that outside stuff. And the reformation of his is when he's dealing with kids in the, in the school system and he's starting to see, God damn, boy, we're putting a foot on their neck before they even getting started. And he learns his reformation that way. That's where you can have some real reformation in the police of them living in the community. So make that demand also. Let the NBA make the NBA players make that demand. That in our municipalities, you should offer police officers 1% mortgages attached to blighted properties in our communities and it incentivizes people to become a part of the police force from the community that we are seeing over-policed. Right where they actually have an opportunity to build their own life with owning a home, treasury going right back to the city, and you are getting rid of blighted property, and you are increasing community policing. Mm -hmm. We make those demands as NBA players in all of our municipalities. Put that on your agenda as well. It will. I just, I can't, that, 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 that part about a C, and I'm, I'm quite sure this was like an executive, somebody with power, somebody with hiring power. That's, yeah, exactly. That that's ran our show, and that's how they saw black life. Do we kiss our kids? We kiss our kids. Uh, you guys are so young. I don't know if you saw the movie Sounder. If you get a chance to see that, now we're in quarantine. Sounder. Yeah. Sounder. Paul Winfield said the biggest question he got, and that was 72. No, and the scene, he comes back, he's a sharecropper in the South, man, and he gets, and he's wrongfully imprisoned, and he's coming home, he's crippled and all, and they celebrate Thanksgiving, right? Right. He's home. And the biggest question he got on the press tour was, do black people celebrate Thanksgiving? <sighs> that was the curiosity, right? And I remember when he told me that, I said, but you know, Paul, I can appreciate that question, because that's an honest question. Because if I'm a white person who I know the foot I'm putting up in the black folks' ass, right. <laughs> they shouldn't have anything to be thankful about. So right. when I see the next one, I'm going to ask them, do y'all celebrate Thanksgiving? Because <laughs> I probably wouldn't. The foot I'm putting in your ass, right, right. I wouldn't even think y'all would have anything to celebrate. But <laughs> that was the curiosity. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Do you celebrate Thanksgiving? Y'all had in that movie, y'all had Thanksgiving dinner. Y'all ain't have shit. Right. That's got you just were in prison wrongfully. You're crippled now, so you can't do no farming. You're a sharecropper. What the hell your black ass celebrating Thanksgiving for? That's really what he wants to say. Right, right. <laughs> wow. Put that on your agenda, man. That would be a strong statement, too. Yeah. That part of the community, the community engagement that the NBA players are demanding of their colleagues. Because we're not employees. We're business partners with the owners. Right. Right. They had they had the financial resources to create the teams. I have developed skills unique to just these 200 men that we could take anywhere in the world and destroy anybody. A unique skill set on the highest of levels that you don't have. So this is not management employee. We can't do what we do without the resources you bring to the table and you can't create what you created without us bringing our resources to the table. So let's look at this as a partnership and not management employee. And let's create community benefit agreements in every city. Let's advocate for this change in law to make sure that we have policing change, reformation, and it's mutually beneficial. City government gets paid, blighted property is taken, uh, is removed from the community. People are being put on a tax roll as that property comes back on. And we solve this adverse relationship between community and the police. That's right. true, police. And so right. as NBA players, that's what we're promoting. And with that, 
an expansion a community benefit agreement and empowerment zones where we take max 2% of our marketing budget and make it an economic engine for empowerment zones that we'll designate in each of our team cities and align ourselves with established business incubators like the Black Chamber of Commerce, like the National Urban League and mm -hmm. other. Yeah. Right. I think of aerial investment in Chicago. John Rogers would be great. It's in every city where you can define somebody to put in that place. Right. But community benefit agreements going into empowerment zones and on the legislative side, ask for a tax that zone to be tax free for those ben those new business owners for the first five to ten years. Mm -hmm. Create a tax free zone, which is done all the time in Louisiana. It's called a TIF. I forget what the acronym is for for T I F F tax incentive furlough forgiveness or some shit like that. And so because, and write this down, we believe the 21st century social justice movement is economic development. I like that. I like that. That yeah. goes hand in hand with the political advocacy that is a part of the social justice movement. Right. And then also create that fund. Yeah, that, I love that. A I love that. of the te television revenues going into an escrow account for the next expansion teams, and when it meets that target, it goes to a minority owner. Right. Fuck a Rooney rule. Right, right. We don't need a fucking interview. That's what it should be in the NFL. The next coach hired, and the coaching ranks should reflect the players' ranks. Right. That's why we can say that the first five coaches hired at the end of this NFL season, when Black Monday happens, right. is actually... Black Sunday evening, because they don't wait for the last game to finish before they start firing, right? right? The first five coaches are minority. We can actually move it forward, and you don't have to compromise any sort of intellectual ability or knowledge of the game. Trust me. And if you don't know those coaches, we as the Players Association of the NFL, PL, PLA, or whatever it is, we'll identify them for you. Right. If you don't, because that's, that's the other qualifiers you call it that right. oh i don't know that's a red flag we don't know the pool we don't know where these people are oh okay <laughs> right. Well, that's right that's a bullshit but yeah absolutely <laughs>been incredibly generous with your time i do have one more question and i'll make a shorter answer <laughs> so in terms of representation again you've played a lot of incredible roles two though that i wanted to particularly call out and you already alluded to one of them in the introduction so in in jack ryan playing greer uh obviously a, a muslim character for those that haven't seen the show and then Willie Loman and Death the Salesman, obviously a, a very different take. First time it had been done on the West End and, and really added just a whole new layer to, to the story with the Loman family being black. In terms of representation, how did you approach those and, and reflecting those? As you already mentioned, you're, you're a practicing Catholic. You know, was that a challenge in any way? Obviously, you're an actor, so it's part of what you're paid to do. But just providing that representation to the communities in, in ways that hadn't been done before. What happens is the fact that there's, there's no situation you can think of that black folks weren't a part of, you know? There's always the assumption that oh, in this community, this is probably something that, you know, people always challenge. They couldn't be a traveling salesman, a black salesman in the 1940s. What are you talking about? What are you talking about, right? So um, the representation of Greer, I'm proud of that because I actually... I have someone who I worked with who uh, I, I can't say his name because he's CIA. He's ex CIA. He's retired CIA who was black. The first question I asked him was, how can you be a black man and be a part of the CIA? Knowing the history of the CIA, COINTELPRO, mm. all of that. Yeah. You know, the knowledge of the CIA's involvement in Patrice Lumumba's assassination, the attempted assassination of Malcolm X when he went on his hodge, the CIA was following him. Uh, the attempted assassination of Malcolm X on the freeways of LA, the assassination of Malcolm X, how conveniently uh, uh, the, the New York police was pulled off and all of that. Right. Knowing how you know intelligence agencies treated the black power movement or black 
uh, communities in general. How, as a black man in America, are, can you be a CIA agent? He says, your father is a veteran? He says, yeah. That's it. The same way your father could be a veteran. What happens is black folks fight for the America this country could be. Right. Right? And that's why this country owes a great debt to a community that has no reason to show any loyalty to this country. Mm. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Mm. But what this country can be is the reason we're still in the game. And he told me, you want to, you fight racism, right? You fight, you fight against racism. He said, yeah. He said, we all fight against it, right? We try to recognize it. He said, yeah. He said, there's racism in America. There's racism in the CIA. I'm going to fight it in America. And I just thought, I'll join the CIA. I'll fight it from me within. If there's something I can't do, I can step away from it. There's knowledge that I know somebody else might step in. But I will do those things necessary to fight against something that I think is improper. You know, that is racist. That is, and he said, just like you, I'm going to fight racism wherever I see it. I just choose to fight it from within the CIA. I can fight racism in the CIA from outside or inside. And I just chose inside. He said, and the resources that you have then to fight it are up. up And just like that same impulse that black police officers had, like this criminality does not reflect my community. So they joined the police officer, the police force to fight that. He approached the CIA that way. And so that's why, that's how I play James Greer. This is a man who understands his community, understands the resources, and the power that this country has, if directed in the right way, the power that it has. And as, as a practicing Muslim, now more than ever, it's important to protect his community from those who may take the resources of the CIA and act against them in the wrong way and try to try to embrace uh, and, and in some way protect the community that he loves. Being in the forces and, and, and even call his community to task also when he sees something not done the right way. For Willie Lohman, I was, the obstacles in pla- placed in front of a black man in the 40s that eats away at his mental facility that drives him to the point of suicide. The thing that I studied the most was why didn't these cats commit suicide more? That's a really interesting thing that the taboo of suicide in the African American community has probably saved a lot of lives. The taboo of mental illness in the black community as seen as a sign of weakness if you fess up to it has probably saved a lot of lives because the last thing someone would want to do is to leave that mark of shame on their family. Because I started, when I started doing Death of a Salesman, I started to research, it's like, you would think suicide would be at a higher rate after all the shit that these men and women in these communities are being put through. And you have, I've, as I've researched, you have these spikes. The Igbo tribe that actually has is, is become mythology in, in, in literature and stuff, that they walk back to Africa. And Song of Solomon is another book where they talk about the Igbo, the Igbo tribe that uh, saw, saw the, the land of America and walked back to Africa across the waters. Well, it comes from a real event of where there was a mass suicide. Well, this is as far as I got into research, and I have to find out if this is mythology or not, but it comes from the story of there was a mass suicide of Africans in the Savannah Harbor that chose to drown themselves to be taken into slavery. And we know that happened on ships and stuff like that, we, those accounts. And then you think about you know incidents where you have suicide by cop. You think about some other protests and stuff. You know, you're going, hey, man, I'm going into this. I know I'm likely to die, but I don't care. I'm so fed up. So 
when I was playing Death of a Salesman, when I was being Willie Loman, I took that off of Willie Loman, thing that would not allow him to commit suicide. And I actually, this was the first time I actually had to be very careful about allowing the psyche of a role to affect me personally, yeah. because it was very easy to see. Yeah. It's very easy to see. Yeah. Someone could lose themselves. Right. And take their life with so much being placed on them. The thought of it fucks with me even now. And to, as an actor and a student of human behavior, you allow yourself to go there and create the world so strong that it induces the behavior. And that is acting. It is a psychological leap that you create the instances of the character's experience so strong psychologically for yourself that it induces the behavior. You just allow those things to impact you. And I have a greater appreciation for those who are driven to suicide. Because what happens is, is it, they see it as a logical step to end a pain. And I think they rationalize a, a behavior that they can't second guess. Or the act doesn't allow them the second chance to rethink it because it's so permanent. I think there are moments, I think there are moments in that death a lot of times, there's a flash of regret, I'm almost certain. And then I'm sure there are people that go, we're all gonna die, eventually I have to face this. And I'd rather face it now than continue the pain, the level of pain that I'm feeling. So to explore those things, that's the role of art. So all of those who saw the play, saw the interpretation, it makes them think of what that means to us as a society. And I would hope that they walk away from that. And in this time, say, I don't want to participate in bringing that much personal pain to anyone. And mm -hmm. so now, let's change some things. And I think that's what's happening. People came to that epiphany when they saw the knee on that man's neck. And that's what I would hope interpretations like Death of a Salesman would do for people as they walked out of the theater. I would never want to participate in that destruction of a man. And I would never allow that to happen within my own family and society. And so it was necessary to change that. Wow. That, that's heavy, man. I mean, that's, um, I, think, I think some, I, and I appreciate that. I appreciate you going into that. Because I've never heard an actor talk about that, you know, getting into that, into a role or mm. I've often wondered about that. Like, how do you, like, where's that line that you know you can't cross right. um, yeah. to not, you know, affect who you are as a, as a person? Well, you start, you have to tap into those things within yourself to understand it. You know, it's you know, all those insecurities that Willie Loman has, I have to find those in my, on my best, best days behind me. Um, um, have I, you know, have I, have I run the course of any sort of significance in my life? And, uh, man, my age, you, that's an easy thing to tap into. Right, you know? it was tough, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and you just go, wow, man. I mean, and you think about it, man, you know, uh, until you get there, man, it's, you just go, wow, man, I have, fewer days ahead of me than behind me. Right. And that's a fact of life for me. Even if I live to my father's age of 95, right. I have fewer days in front of me than behind me. Right. Right. And that's a reality that you only know about and intellectually can understand um, when you're younger or you read about it. And when people say that, I, I'm feeling my mortality. And then when you feel this shit, you'd be like, oh, that's different. Right. But acting is closer to psychology than anything else. That's why I always tell people, as an actor, you are a student of human behavior. If these conditions exist, what are the impact on the person? And what sort of behavior is solicited, right? What happens? Don't think about the behavior. Think about the stuff, 
the fuel that goes into it. It's just kind of like, listen, man, you practice your moves going to the hoop so that in the game, you can just respond. Cat comes here, you go, oh, I'm going to do the spin shit. I've done it so many times that it becomes sort of uh, a, a, just a reaction. I don't have to think about it. Oh, I'm going to go this, I'm going to do that. I, you know, you react. And it's the same thing with the acting that you create the world so strong that it induces the behavior. And that's why I tell people, actors are students of human behavior. Perfect example, if you think about, oh, you know, my mother gets killed in the street, right? Well, I'm going to look this way. I get the word and I'm going to run out and all. You never know how you're going to react. Right, right. So you always make bad choices when, as an actor when you try to decide, oh, I'm going to behave this way. My mother got hit. Oh, my God. Right? Because that's what you think intellectually happened. But when the shit really happens, you go, what? Get the fuck out of here, man. What you mean my mama just got hit up a car? What? Man, come on, man. Don't fuck with me, David. Man, don't fuck with me, man. Then the cat gets mad at the guy who fuck. You telling me my mama dead? Don't right. tell me that, David. Don't you tell <laughs> Before you fucking break down. Right. There's the laughter of get the fuck out of here. Then it's like you mad at the bearer of bad news. Fuck you, David West. You're not going to call and tell me my mama just got killed, man. Right. And don't tell me my mama just, how many times have we seen that, man? That's right. I think that's one of the most profoundly moving times when you see someone get the news of a death in the family and say, man, don't tell me that, man. Man, when I see that, oh, I step away, man. It's just kind of like, that is hallowed ground. Step away from that man or that woman. They, that is the most precious moment, most sacred moment. And that's, actors always make the bad choice. <laughs> David, mama, are you telling me my mama did? Right, right. And we're going to see that shit a thousand times, man. Right. I mean, show me the real shit. You know, because you even know, say, man, especially when you're the bearer of bad news, where you have to give the bad news, you're like, man, this, this cat's going to go off or right. it's, it's going to happen. But even the shock, I found my mother dead. Mm -hmm. I thought there's nowhere in the world that I would be able to find my mother dead. And I was stone cold silent. I just couldn't believe it. And my father couldn't hear. And he's in the bathroom. So he doesn't know that he just got out of bed. His wife is dead. And all I could think about was, how am I going to tell my father? He's right there. And I just found my mother dead. And I knew what stilled me is the fact that what was the only thing that possibly was greater than finding my mother dead was to tell my father at 87 years old, that he had lost the woman he had been married to for 60 years, mm -hmm. that he had just gotten out of bed with. And I knew he couldn't hear me. So how am I going to tell him? And I had to be the one to tell him and allow, be there for him as he came to the realization that is... That's real life, and real life is almost always more interesting than what bad actors and bad directors choose to put in. Right, you know, right. the music spells, oh, my father, father, what? Oh, mother is dead. Oh, two men screaming and shit. But it's one brother just standing in the midst of the stillness with paramedics and people rushing around, giving just a gesture to his father, and the father at 87 realizing he's lost this woman. And the stillness of that, right? I can see the camera pushing in to my stillness as all this shit goes around. Right. You know, that's such a more interesting thing that then goes to black. And the audience is there and takes that in. Just go, that's acting. That's acting. That's acting. The closer thing to psychology, be a student of human behavior. And that's the role of art, too, to reflect on things. As a community, what thoughts are to the individual, that's what art is to everyone around you as a whole. So you reflect on it, decide what your values are, and then act on them. Entertainment is just a byproduct of what art is. Art is the forum where we come together collectively 
And as individuals reflect on where they've been and where they hope to go, we as collectively come together and reflect on who are we, where have we been, where are we going to go, what our triumphs are, what our failures are, what are our values, and then let's go out there and act on it. If I can move people to that discussion about what their values are and then ultimately move them to act, that's the role of art. And as an athlete, you are an artist. You move people with your creativity of your skill set that what you have done, that people can look at what you've done and go, wow, that's human achievement that we collectively have come together to see. And because you have given us the highest level of human achievement, you have earned the platform that you have now to say, this is what we want in our society. Mm. So fuck anybody that says to you, shut up and dribble. Fuck them. Right. Because I have achieved the highest level of human skill that has earned me a platform in the world to then say, this is what we demand in the society. That's perfect. What do you think, Rick? I, I don't see how we could top that ending. Yeah, it's pretty good. Man. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I'm 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 a huge fan. Uh, you know, Ricky's yeah. a fan as well. But I like I, I'm a big. I've held it in, man. But I'm a big. I'm, I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm a man. Like <laughs> David was. Yeah, I could I could listen because I you know again I I I prided myself on being able to speak, but I I've always looked at you and listened to the way you articulate. And, you know, you use your voice. And, you know, I, I when you're on TV, no, I'm watching. When you're doing an interview, be like, all right. If you, if just like I used to be with my mom, I'd be like, if I'm on TV, I know my mom is watching. Yeah. Just know that, you know that I'm watching. I'm learning. Get it, man. Absolutely. Share that. I know you guys are getting together. Share that platform. So I will. Stuff. I will. I definitely will. That's powerful stuff. And so, and and no, also, it's not. The discussion is not about. It's not about. Hey, man, you're wrong if you play, or you're wrong if you don't play. Right. Don't get caught up in that. Say, brothers, that's a personal choice for you to make. But let's all agree on a platform of shit that we have. Right. Skill set of human endeavor has given us a platform. It's not a gift. That's the other thing. You got to get a, I have a platform. No one gave you that platform. You earned it. That's the other thing. It's not a gift. So no one gave you the platform. So I'm going to get out of that habit of saying, well, you know, I've been given this platform. You earn the right to say the things that you have. So we are not working. And you, it should be a part of the statement of like, there will be players who choose not to play and players that choose to play. But that is not the debate. Because right. we're not working in competition with each other. We're working in concert with each other. Right. That's an important phrase to remember. Because those who do not have our best interests at heart will always try to divide us. And use any sort of different, of course, we're going to have different opinions on agenda and how we should go about. But whenever you get in those conflicts, always say, hey, listen, we may not agree on some things, but understand this. We are not in competition with each other. We are in concert with each other. Right. That's what even Malcolm said when he came down to Birmingham. He said the only, his only trip south in the middle of the civil rights movement. He said, Coretta, I came here to let them know if they mess with Martin, they're going to have to deal with me. I'm not coming down here to put Martin down. I'm coming down here to let him know. If y'all going to mess with Martin, y'all going to have to deal with me. So y'all can try to get rid of Martin Luther King Jr., but you're going to have to deal with me. And that's the perpetuation of that is you're not in competition, you're in concert. That's what needs to be communicated right now with LeBron and with Kyrie. You're not in competition. Because, you know, they're going to try to play, oh, you know, yeah, that shit goes all the way back to Cleveland, you know. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Motherfucker getting mad about a pass or you didn't run the play the right way and you didn't get right. get you in the post and shit. Let me get the fuck out of here. Right. It feels in comparison with this discussion. I understand what you're saying and I'm on the same track. I'm choosing right. different, different ways to go about it. They jointly get them to understand that and say, we are not working in competition. All right. In concert with each other, right? Got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. That on to the brothers too. 
Absolutely, I will. I absolutely will. Thank you, Mr. West. It's an honor to meet you, Ricky. Honor to meet you, and uh, thank you, man. Appreciate Sorry. it, Wendell. Be well. All right, be well, man. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Forward Thinking featuring Wendell Pierce. This podcast is presented by the Professional Collegiate League, co-hosted by David West and myself, Ricky Vellante, and also produced by Rafa Hernandez-Brito, Wendell Haskins, and myself. We look forward to bringing you another interesting conversation next week. In the meantime, have a good one and stay safe out there.